Okay, and I think... I think we're live. Okay. Okay, um, hello and welcome everybody to today's Plumbers of Data Science session where we're uh, going to talk about uh, data engineering and data science at OLX. And I have a guest here, Alexei Grigorev, and he um, is, a data, is a senior data scientist um, at OLX and he's going to show us a bit of uh, stuff they are doing with image processing and how they are how they're yeah tackling the problems they have um let me just bring alexei in here right now he's not visible okay here he is um hello hi alexei uh, maybe if you want you can you can make a quick introduction and Tell the people a bit about uh, yourself and what you're doing and why why you do what you do. Yep, sure. Uh, so my name is Alexei. Um, I am Russian uh, originally. Now I live in Berlin, in Germany. Um, originally, my background is uh, uh, database systems. Um, this was uh, the topic of my bachelor studies. Um, after graduation, I worked uh, a bit as a software engineer, mostly Java related stuff. But then um, around the time when Coursera appeared, there was uh, this topic of machine learning and it got me really interested in, uh, in that. So I started to transition there to data science, to machine learning around that time. And uh, at the end, I even decided to do a master's um, in business intelligence. So I uh, did a master at uh, TU Berlin. Um, and uh, I've been working in data science uh, since 2013. First, uh, part time, uh, I tried to combine it with my studies. Um, but then, after graduating in, from TU Berlin, I worked uh, full time uh, in Berlin. Um, so, I participated in a few Kaggle competitions in the past. Uh, I am a Kaggle master. I do not do uh, competitions anymore that often uh, right now. Um, I also happen to write a book about uh, Java and uh, data science. Um, and now I work uh, at OLX as a data scientist. Um, that's pretty much about me. Okay. Why uh, Why have you, uh, or, or what was the idea to come to, to Berlin and, and study there? Uh, that was an accidental choice. So actually, the program is not just Berlin. It is um, uh, like it's Erasmus Mundus program. This is like a bunch of universities. You study in each of these universities. Uh, for me, it was first in Belgium, then in France, and then in Germany. Oh. And originally, I planned to study uh, to do specialization in France. And then I thought, okay, let's try Berlin because it uh, sounds like uh, the topic uh, of the specialization was large scale business intelligence. So things like, um, you know, data engineering things. And uh, to you, Berlin, uh, the group there, the database group there, they are the creators of Apache Flink. And I thought, mm -hmm. yeah, these are really cool people. I really want to, to learn from them. Um, so one of the teachers, apart from being involved in Flink, for example, is a committer to Apache Mahout. Um, mm. So they also do a bunch of other things also around Apache ecosystem. So I thought this is a great group to to learn from. So I decided to go to Berlin. And okay. after that, like after studying there for one year, um, my wife and me liked the city. So we decided to stay there, to stay here, to settle down. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. fine. Interesting. So you're mentioning Flink. Have you have you done work with Flink? Have you looked into that? Yes. Uh, I also worked a bit at DIMA, like a database management system group uh, in uh, at TU Berlin. Um, there, the project I was involved in was to uh, do an image, uh, sorry, a linear algebra library. Uh, on top of Apache Flink. So for mm -hmm. doing this whole matrix multiplication in a distributed way, and I was involved in, in that. Uh, it was a part of my Apache Mahout project. So in there you have a language in Scala for expressing linear algebra operations. And then you can have different uh, backends that uh, 
actually compute these expressions. And uh, uh, Apache Spark was one of the backends, and Apache Flink was uh, another. Mm. So I was working on the Flink part. So the Spark part was mostly done, and I was trying to to convert it to Flink. Mm. Interesting, because people are are telling me, or what I have seen is that uh, there's always the question: Do I do Spark, or do I use something like Flink, or some other stuff like Storm, or, or mm -hmm. and and uh, I haven't uh, myself gone it gone the Flink route before, so uh, it's interesting to have someone on the, <laughs> who already. Uh, it's has popular some... in Berlin. I know a bunch of companies who use Flink. Uh... Uh, but mostly it's people choose Spark. Mm -hmm. It's more popular, community is bigger. Uh, but Flink has also its use cases. Okay, cool. Um, interesting. Do you want to want to start with, with sharing a bit of stuff about, about OLX? Yes, of course. And, uh, so. Because I found, I found this very interesting. In, in Germany, you don't know OLX. So... Yes. Exactly. So uh, <laughs> I already talked about me, so I'll go to, uh, to the slide. So OLX Group. So OLX is a bunch of uh, brands. They are all part of OLX Group. Um, so what OLX does is online classifieds. So when people want to sell stuff online, this is the place where they go. So it's like eBay, like Craigslist. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, and to, you see this, there is a bunch of brands. So Avita, for example, is the largest online classifieds in Russia. Um, Let Go is also um, quite popular uh, mobile first uh, classified system in the States. And OLX that we that I have here mm -hmm. it is also present as a brand in quite a few countries. Okay. Um, yeah, so OLX is a brand is present, I think, in 30 countries. Um, like OLX Poland is the biggest uh, country, uh, like biggest amount of uh, um, users, biggest amount of listings. Uh, then Ukraine is the second biggest. And also is uh, India, like India is very promising. We're trying to put a lot of resources to make it more popular, to make it more trustworthy. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, especially in India, this is one of the key markets for for Elix. Um, so there, there are across all Elix, uh, there are two hundred million unique monthly users. Um, there are ten million uh, sellers, uh, people who want to to sell stuff, and uh, there are thirty million buyers, people who contact sellers in order to do something per month. And uh, per month, there are approximately 30 million new listings posted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, that's yes, a lot. Interesting. That's, that is quite a lot. Yeah. Um, so this uh, whole thing, um, like there are a few tech hubs where it is, uh, is developed and maintained. Um, so we have a tech hub in uh, uh, Poland, the biggest one, uh, mm -hmm. then a tech hub in Lisbon. Uh, take up in uh, Buenos Aires uh, in Argentina, uh, take up in uh, India, in Delhi, and also mm -hmm. in Berlin. Um, okay. So people often ask, why Berlin? So because Olix is not present in Germany. In Germany, no one knows about Olix. Yeah. Um, so it is quite close to Poland. It is a big city, uh, and many people find Germany attractive. So it's very easy to, to relocate people to Berlin. Many people want to go here. Uh, so also talent is uh, like the city is bigger. It's uh, easier to find people uh, here than in other cities. Yeah, um, yeah that, 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 that's also what I what I have heard and what I have experienced here is that people are also always looking for for Berlin because not only the startup scene is the biggest there. It's the 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 tech companies are there in in Berlin. Yes. And um, what I heard from Olix is since. Um, up until recently, there was no Google uh, hiring people, there is no Facebook, and there is a lot of smart people. So they thought, okay, Berlin is an excellent choice to to go here and uh, hire all these people. Mm. Before like big giant companies come and, yeah. uh, 
Yeah. So it's quite big, it's growing. There are 200 people right now, I think, in Berlin office. Uh, but the Germans do not know about Alex. So maybe <laughs> we need to change ask this. Me, yes. <laughs> Where do you work as Alex? They have no idea. But if somebody from India hears that, they know. Uh, somebody from yeah. Poland, they also know. So it's yeah. the it's a recognizable brand in these countries. Okay. Not yeah, I'm, I'm guessing the the India market is is a is a huge growth market that has a lot of a lot of potential. Yes, and it's uh, it has a lot of potential. And uh, compared to Poland, India is a lot larger country, right? But mm. still, um, it's uh, I don't know, five six times less. So we want really to invest uh, effort into making it better, making you know, attracting people to use the platform in India. Because we believe this is like the next best, like the next big thing. Hmm. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, that, that absolutely makes sense. Uh, yes. Um, okay. Um, so, when you want to sell something on classifieds, um, online classifieds, uh, especially. You want to like when you want to buy you want to see an image if you want to buy a car you want to see all the scratches of the, on the car if you want to buy a phone you want to see the condition of this phone so images are very important for serving images there is a special team special product inside oil um, called apollo this is nothing else uh, but uh, image costing for all uh, um, oil sites uh, so like it's a central centralized uh, place where all other websites from Poland, from Ukraine, from India uh, can upload images and then can uh, get them from there. Mm -hmm. um, to, to give you an idea of scale, so there are uh, 10 million images uploaded every day, a bit more on uh, Friday, for example, a bit less on uh, Sunday. Uh, okay. but the scale is uh, approximately that. 30% uh, of that um, come from Poland. Uh, 1 million, 10% of that come from Ukraine. Uh, India is uh, slightly smaller, so it's uh, only 700,000 images, and all other countries uh, also like mm -hmm. more than 50% of that. Um, and uh, Okay. For it's, th that's yes. interesting. So, so you you already see that th this stuff is running on Amazon. Yes, how do I know that? So, ah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the names of the so and so. <laughs> yeah. So Ireland is our biggest uh, cluster. Um, so of course, it's not just like so people from Poland. They do not go to Ireland because we have Akamai. So the, we have a C content distribution network that takes care of. Uh, you know, fetching first from Ireland and then having the images uh, cached uh, like in a geographically distributed way. So people from Poland, for them it's fast. Uh, people from Ukraine, for them it's fast. Um, even though the cluster is located in um, Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, for India, we um, have a cluster in Asia, um, in Singapore. Um, we also have a cluster in Frankfurt. Uh, for a bunch of European countries, and um, in the States, uh, it's not super utilized at the moment, um, uh, but this is for Americas, for South America, and uh, Latin America. Hmm. Uh, we don't have anything in North America, but the cluster is there. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. Um, so what I'm doing here um, is uh, I'm part of the data science team. What is interesting for us, what we want to solve, is to understand what is on these images. So if an image is good, if, uh, well, first of all, we want to know what is on the image, like what item is there, does the item match the title, the description, or somebody wants to maybe accidentally put uh, an item in the wrong category, or somebody wants to sell something that uh, is forbidden to sell, and of course they will not put this in title, but in the image, and we want to recognize that. Mm. And also we want to understand what is the quality of these images, mm -hmm. uh, whether the image is good and item is visible, uh, or 
the image is bad, it's dark or overly exposed and nothing is mm -hmm. clear. Um, because buyers want to see clear um, images and sellers do not always uh, take time to, to create new images. So how do we do this? Uh, we use machine learning. We have a bunch of models for category detection, for quality detection that we want to, well, that we apply to all these images to find out uh, category and quality of these images. And uh, since our image posting is called Apollo, so I think Apollo or Apollo then is the service that hosts the predictions for Apollo for our image hosting. Mm. Do do you also have or or tackle problems regarding uh, fraudulent uploads? Like like people are using already uploaded uh, images from someone else to to fake a a listing? Yes, um, it is a big problem, and uh, I will come to that a bit later. So there is okay. uh, later I want to talk about duplicates and uh, duplicates and fraud often come together. So uh, okay. just keep it. And let's talk about this uh, yeah, later. Um, so first, how we train these models. Um, we use SageMaker for that. So SageMaker is a tool from uh, Amazon Web Services, from AWS, um, that allows uh, data scientists, machine learning engineers to quickly uh, to get a machine with uh, GPUs and train a model. Uh, it also allows a bunch of other things so like data collection uh, through mechanical Turk. Um, and this is what we use to create a data set. So for example, we run um, an experiment where we, where we asked people, what do you think whether the quality of this image is good, whether something is visible or it's bad and uh, it's not clear, like some things are mm, not visible enough. So mm -hmm. we collected some data and then with SageMaker, it's very easy. You just take data, put it to S3, to file system, and then tell SageMaker, hey, SageMaker, please train me this model and get the data from this location. And then uh, sometime later, so it spins up the machine, uh, does the training and kills the machine. And the machine already has all the libraries configured, like uh, TensorFlow, Keras, or uh, MXNet, uh, or PyTorch. So there are different configurations. They're ready to use. You just say the type of machine you want to have, the type of uh, configuration, and the location with files. And then uh, it does all that automatically. Then it stops the machine, and you're paying only for, uh, for the time you actually this is very handy this is very good because a few years ago it was a lot more difficult so people would need to um, create an empty empty machine install all these libraries uh, like tensorflow or cuda and all that then uh, people would create uh, an image of this uh, of this server like uh, amy uh, and then uh, next time you want to train to, to train something you um, create a machine with this image. So th there is a lot of work to do before you can actually start training. And then mm. serving is also complex. But here they took all this complexity away. They just provided a nice abstraction for like here, this is the API that you call. Just tell us what you want to train and on which data. And then after some time, like it, it just puts the model to S3 and it's uh, ready to be used. Yeah, but uh, how, uh, or let's, let's say the other way. Um, now you're ending up with a model from SageMaker and mm -hmm. um, how do you make sure that, that this model works or does it give you some, some statistics and do you have to check them yourself and then modify the the, uh, the configuration or does the, yes. is there some kind of a automatic step? So it, it can be done like manually, where you say, hey, just uh, apply this model to this data and show me the score and do this. And you can also say, hey, SageMaker, please use this part of the data to evaluate the model and try all these different parameters to find the best um, okay. the best configuration. So you can also do parameter tuning there. 
So what it does under the hood, it spins up many machines and it does all the training in parallel. And then at the end, it shows you, this is the best, this is like the second best. Um, so quite, quite handy. Okay, cool. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, it's also possible once the model is trained, then there is a, a simple API call to start to start serving this model through SageMaker. Mm -hmm. So it creates a SageMaker endpoint, and then you can use it as usual, like for making many different calls. Okay, give me a prediction for this image, for example. Okay, it's very easy to to do this, um, but it is a bit costly, uh, especially if you want to serve predictions for ten. Uh, million images uh, per day. So that's why we uh, created, uh, we put this to our own infrastructure inside Kubernetes. Also, we use AWS for pretty much everything. So this is called Apollo X, the, the main model gateway, sort of. Um, and uh, this is uh, where like the Think that the users interact with. And users in this case are not the end users, not the people in Poland who want to sell or buy stuff. Users in this case are other teams. Uh, for example, the content moderation team. They use this endpoint to understand what is on this image and whether this is prohibited or not. Or the communication team that want to send emails to users and know whether the quality of images is good or not. Um, so user in this case uh, is another team. Uh, so the user that uses um, the users that use our um, system, um, they send the request. It can be a batch request, um, saying, "Hey, please uh, calculate uh, some uh, we call it types of metadata. So please, I want to know what is the category of this image, and I want to know the quality of this image." And then you give it a list of images for which you want to know. And then um, it gets this request. And then depending on the type of the request, it sends um, them to different queues. So this is a simple. So you just put this in a queue. And then at the, the other side of the queue, so uh, an actual model pulls from there. Uh, it says, OK, I need to compute uh, uh, to apply this model to these images. And then uh, this thing here goes to S3 and fetches the actual images and does all the preprocessing that is needed for a model. Um, but the model itself lives in a different container. So it's a different mm -hmm. process. Um, so um, we use uh, TensorFlow serving for serving uh, TensorFlow models. So we have two separated uh, services boxes like one that does all the fetching and preprocessing. And once it's ready, uh, it uh, uses gRPC, a protocol to talk to TensorFlow serving. So this way we split the, uh, the workload into two parts. One is uh, IO heavy, it's talking to S3 because there is some waiting time. Um, and then the other part is uh, computational heavy. So that is just number crunching. And okay. this way, if we split them, we can scale them differently. Um, so for example, we can just have one TensorFlow serving instance, uh, but we might have uh, multiple category uh, services uh, that do the that query uh, S3 and do the processing. Mm -hmm. um, the same happens with uh, the quality model, um, but for quality, we use MXNet. And there's a counterpart in MXNet called MMS. It's a, MXNet model serving. So this is like a TensorFlow serving, but for MXNet. Um, also, we take um, from the queue, like this category takes um, uh, requests in batches. So to optimize throughput, because um, for uh, machine learning models, especially for neural nets, uh, it's important to utilize uh, them better. And for that, uh, typically you chunk the, you take a batch of data at the same time. So this way you have uh, higher throughput, but maybe latency is uh, bigger, but this way you can process a lot more images. Mm -hmm. So then um, this uh, category service processes it, talks to it in the floor serving, gets the predictions, and then send results back to the queue. And then Apollo X uh, 
basically takes these results, saves this to MySQL, to Redis, and then responds back to the user. So this is asynchronous because user has to provide a callback. Uh, then uh, we use this callback to, to inform. Here, okay. uh, your predictions are ready based page time. So uh, these, yes. these, these, uh, these services, are they all um, like written by by you guys? Are there uh, standards or are they based on standards, standard tools or because that sounds uh, all like like some some specially uh, developed, um, let's say pipelines. Yes. On... yes. So TensorFlow Serving is uh, a component that we can just use Docker to pull it. And then we just put a model to it and we use it. It's ready to to go. So this is like a already existing library. Um, other things like this category that does uh, pre-processing or this Apollo X uh, thing, they're custom. So this is what yeah, we wrote okay. ourselves. That's custom. Yeah, um, that's what I, what I thought here. And yes. the queue? The but... queue, this is SQS. So we use uh, Terraform to set uh, everything up, uh, AWS wise. Mm -hmm. um, also, Redis is AWS and MySQL is AWS. Okay. Uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And the actual thing, like these services, they live in Kubernetes. And in Kubernetes, we can just uh, uh, monitor a certain metric like CPU usage. And then if it uh, goes above a certain, certain threshold, then we add more, uh, more instances. Mm -hmm. so what, what I've what I find very, very interesting here is that in, was that in the last podcast we were talking? Yeah, that was in the last podcast where we were talking about, uh, are you, should you use platform as a service or infrastructure as a service? Uh, and and uh, in the case there was, uh, I, I looked at uh, Kinesis mm -hmm. and you guys uh, also went the route that it's uh, like using SageMaker that gets very expensive when you mm -hmm. when you have a lot of a lot of workload, and so you're you're moving more into a a mixture of of infrastructure mm -hmm. as a service and platform as a service tools. That's that's because I always say y you can do everything on on AWS with with uh, the tools, but it's mm -hmm. from AWS, but it gets super expensive. Yes, exactly. So. Um... If it's a few images per day, a uh, like thousand maybe, it's fine. Uh, but then at some point it becomes expensive. Yeah. And then um, we have to develop our own thing to cut the costs. Cool. Um, but we still use all these tools, like um, because we use uh, Kubernetes, we use uh, Terraform to, to organize infrastructure. Um, this is all standardized and it makes it easy to, to deploy things for everyone in the team. So of course we have mm. DevOps uh, um, engineers who make sure infrastructure works, but at the same time, every uh, member of the team can uh, go ahead and just deploy things. It's uh, mm. easy, it's standardized across the company. Uh, so it really makes, uh, it enables us to move faster having this infrastructure. Yeah. So this was, uh, um, an important thing, I think, to 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 make sure this is all developed in the same amount of time is to have uh, a proper infrastructure to uh, to rely on and uh, to have metrics uh, there in place to have logging, uh, to have dashboards, to to have a system that does uh, alerting, for example, and if something goes wrong, uh, uh, sends alerts or uh, in worst case, wake somebody up in the night to, to fix the yeah the, the monitoring part is always yes. difficult you're just uh, letting stuff run that's that's <laughs> that's not mm -hmm. the problem to, to actually figuring out what is happening that's that's more the issue mm -hmm. um we have we have some some questions here um maybe we go to to two questions mm -hmm. uh, i think one is already we can already simply answer um one is uh from Nick, how the model deployment and maintenance process looks like here. Um, this came during the SageMaker uh, mm -hmm. slide, but I think this is this is also interesting yes. here. 
So we create a model here, and then we say, okay, this is a model of this type and version of the model, say, V2 or V10, whatever. So there is a certain version now. And then we just uh, redeploy this thing. We say, hey, now TensorFlow serving. Uh, so we, we create a new image with the new, uh, new Docker image with the new model. And then we uh, replace the existing uh, instances with the new image. If nothing changed in pre-processing, all we do is just to replace this thing. Mm. Um, in Kubernetes, it's also possible to um, do some kind of uh, canary deployment. Um, I think that's the term when you uh, keep the old thing running, but also add new, and then you compare how well it uh, performs. And then it's if it's fine, you roll out uh, the deployment to to all instances. No, oh, okay, that's cool. That's interesting. Okay. Um, Another question, <laughs> I think this is this is very uh, simple to answer. Are these manual processes or automated processes? Well, once uh, to, to do it once, it's uh, manual because like we need to do all this uh, uh, Terraform config, but once it's done manually, then you can just copy and paste and put it to a different cluster mm. or deploy it in a different region. So this, okay. uh, so this is more automatic than my own. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I'm guessing it has to be because with yes. that workload you can. Yeah, especially at no longer multiple, manage uh, multiple regions. Uh, it's not really possible to do this manually. Hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That's interesting. Okay. So we also use quite heavily events from S3 bucket. So the moment, um, so the image hosting platform Apollo. When something is uploaded to the to the hosting, it's stored in S3, and the moment something appears in S3, uh, S3 generates uh, an event saying, "Hey, something was something was put to bucket. Please do something with this." So we can subscribe to these events, and uh, we can pre-compute everything in advance. So the moment something is uploaded, we can already know what is on that image, like a few seconds after. Too. Mm. And then we just put this to to our database, and then the moment the user asks for it, for it, we have it already prepared. So when, for example, moderation team wants to know if there are prohibited items uh, on the image, then we say, yeah, there are some items, so they don't need to wait. It's already pre-calculated. Um, cool. Yeah. Okay, that's that's a very clever way of of. Mm -hmm of managing this huh. yes and uh, this is a really handy tool um i tend to to use it for like i'll show you later um what uh, is the other use case for that um uh, for duplicates um yeah but it's a easy way to integrate it with existing system so in this apollo system uh we don't need to write any uh like callbacks or events uh, or whatever saying that the image is uploaded. We don't need to touch this at all. All we need to do is to communicate through S3. So the existing uh, system is untouched. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a very nice way to, to integrate an easy way. Cool. OK. So I guess I go next, right? Um, so it was already. We covered it a bit, but um, many people ask, like, why not use SageMaker? Why do you want to go through all these troubles of developing your own thing? Uh, yeah, SageMaker is good uh, because it allows, like, it's, it allows you to move fast. You can train a model and quickly test it. So it's actually good to, for example, when we develop a model, we can just try it on. Uh, small fraction of users to see how they react to it, like just to test whether the model is useful or not before spending time on uh, putting it uh, in proper infrastructure. SageMaker is great for that. Uh, but as I said, it's a bit expensive. And also, it's harder to monitor in existing infra because, for example, we have like Prometheus, Grafana, and all these kind of tools in uh, um, in our existing infra, but uh, 
in uh, SageMaker, it's uh, uh, CloudWatch events uh, uh, that is harder to 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 use. And um, our um, site availability engineers, they are not super happy when something is external, because if it, something goes wrong, uh, they do not have a lot of control to fix this. So this is mm -hmm. uh, a sort of black box. So you don't always have enough transparency to understand what's going on, to quickly uh, find the logs for the thing. And they are, of course, used to the existing infra, to existing way of doing things. So it's a lot better for maintaining the model to, to host it in our master. Uh, that's pretty much uh, why we uh, decided to go through all these troubles and create uh, our own. Uh, system for for hosting models. Hmm. Um, it, just a, a quick question before we uh, before we move forward. Um, Nick was was uh, saying he's trying to understand how this all can can help us in data engineering and our daily work. I think this is this is one part that is that is very very uh, important to make the to try to find or make the decision what what is. Uh, what tools are you using? Should you go something that is hosted by a provider or should you go self-hosting? And uh, and that this is that you can build something like this completely in the cloud with AWS and then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so yeah, continue, <laughs> please. Um, Let's just... yes. uh, so now I just wanted to show some results. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Or yeah, so you want to ask my opinion about this question? Sorry. Um, uh, can you can you just go a slide back for, for a yeah, second? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. I, I thought we we missed something in the bottom because I I uh, talked over you, uh, but I think we had other thing here. Yeah. So now I just wanted to show like how what is the output of the model. So why did we do this? Uh, um, so one of the things is image quality. Um, so we want to to make sure that uh, the buyers will uh, will see what is on the image, and it's not always the case. People do not always take time to take a proper picture, and uh, we want to to help them sell the, their things. And mm -hmm. uh, we see that if item um, hasn't received any replies in a few days. So nobody contacted the seller asking about the, for example, the car here. Uh, then we sent an email. First we sent an email saying, hey, if the, we think price is not right, we first sent a mail saying, maybe you should think about price, maybe it's too high. Um, but yeah. then if it doesn't help, we think it might be because of the image. Uh, then we if we think if our model tells this is because of the image, then we actually uh, reach out to the client, uh, to the seller, saying probably you should think uh, like if you want you want to sell your um, car, you should consider taking better pictures because buyers uh, it's hard to see the item for buyers. Um, okay. And there are different dimensions in uh, quality, so there is focus. Uh, there is uh, light, like exposure, um, and also cropping. Like if an Im like if an image contains only only half of the car, or like it doesn't contain. Mm -hmm. the car, for example. Okay, so they um, they, they uh, deliberately left out the the dent in the yes. fender. <laughs> so this is example, for example, important for cover images to include the entire car, so people don't just see a wheel of a car, but the uh -huh. entire thing. Um, and sometimes uh, sellers also uh, put uh, like when they upload images, the first image in among like uh, among these images is selected to be the cover image, something that people buyers see in search on the, the home feed. So this is like the thumbnail uh, of an ad. And if uh, people do not select it properly, often uh, it doesn't get a lot of attention. So, for example, um, a sensible way to select uh, 
front picture, cover picture would be like if you want to sell a car to actually put the car in the image, but not all people do this. And sometimes uh, there are internals of a car, the steering wheel, the wheel, the engine end up as the mm -hmm. first image. And people like buyers tend not to click on this kind of image. So we want to also say the cover image that you have does not appear to be the, the front of the car. So consider changing it. Um, hmm. Okay. It's interesting because because the 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 value for OLX is is more like people are are selling their their stuff faster or, or have a better better chance of selling. So they are they are have a higher yeah. a possibility to coming back and and selling something else. Yeah. So we want to make both sides happy. We want to make sellers happy want like if they sell things successfully they're happy we're happy as well so they come back uh, and also buyers so if buyers manage to find what they're looking for they next time they want to find something they come back again so of course we want to make this transaction happen and the more transaction we, we like the more transaction happen the more engagement the platforms hmm. that's cool yeah um, another use case um, is uh, sometimes people sell things that they are not supposed to sell, uh, especially like prohibited items like um, uh, like uh, guns or machetes or whatnot. Um, we want to find this as quick as possible uh, before the ad goes live. So when somebody posts uh, an ad, there is some time moderators uh, review the ad. And uh, it's typically a few minutes. So during this time, we need to help moderators to look at the things that really require attention. Like maybe there is mm, a gun okay. somewhere somebody tries to sell. And uh, sometimes it happens that these things uh, go live, and this is bad mm -hmm. for everyone. Um, so if somebody gets a chance to buy a gun, this is the worst possible scenario. But also it's bad um, because um, like, um, uh, for example, a competition or somebody, um, they will quickly post to uh, social media saying, hey, there is guns on the uh, So this is quite, uh, quite bad. So <laughs> we want to, to prevent this from happening. And in some cases, we even contact um, local authorities saying uh, that uh, something is really bad. Uh, um, uh, the, the, so the thing is this is not a as i understand it this is not a hundred percent automated step it, it's a help for for moderators to to uh, show them interesting items they they should look at yes so because uh, there are only uh, there's only limited amount of moderators there's only limited mm -hmm. amount of time they can put and we want to show them the most important thing that require attention so if something is safe mm. uh, they shouldn't bother checking this because it's safe but if something looks like a gun could be a toy gun but better be yeah. safe than sorry yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think in this case actually uh, you see this uh, red thing on the gun uh, yeah. so I think it's a replica but uh, it looks uh, real right so it's better for a human to look at this and then uh, decide uh, um, whether to to allow this to go live or not? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. The, the the thing is, you you what you don't want to do is uh, go go automated too quickly and and filter out stuff that is allowed on the yes. platform and then have have customers who are pissed off. Yes. Because, so this is a common type of complaint. Like, where is my ad? Why it is gone? Oh. So we want to make it to have sellers have the best experience, but also buyers to not get exposed to things uh, yeah. like that. Huh. Um, other thing we you already asked about this, like fraudsters and duplicates. So fraud and duplicates they come hand by hand. So often somebody, for example, when somebody wants to cheat people uh, to get money from them, um, they take a picture of an existing ad and then they post it on the platform and they pretend that this is a new item and people contact them and then 
one of the cases we see is uh, they ask for payment in advance or for a part of payment in advance. Uh, they get the money and then they disappear. So this is mm. really bad. Uh, people lose trust in colleagues. They do not want to come back. Do not want to deal with the platform anymore. So uh, we want to prevent this from happening. Um, so we have a system uh, for getting for catching, catching duplicates. Um, so we did a, some calculation, and it turns out that uh, uh, based on images, ten percent of ads contain an image that uh, already exists on the platform in some other app. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, these cases are when people, like sellers, they cannot sell their car or something, then they just post it another time. So these are real duplicates. Um, so, for example, we have a service for promoting an ad, um, but they don't use it because it's uh, paid. So they can just delete their ad, create a new one, and, and it will automatically bump to the top. Uh, mm. Yeah. And then there is another case. This is uh, innocent, but still, uh, like if there are duplicates on the platform, this is bad for user experience. Um, like if people scroll, need to scroll through the same item, uh, this is bad for, for everyone. But there is another case when it's actually fraudulent and the item doesn't exist and uh, uh, people want to, to scam uh, other people to get money from them. And these are also often duplicates. Um, so for this purpose, we um, developed a system based on image caches uh, uh, to find duplicates. So briefly talk about image caches. So like there is MP5 hash, probably everyone knows about this uh, type of hash. So this is a sort of checksum of uh, a file. So it can be calculated for every file and uh, if you change uh, the file slightly, if you change one bit from one to zero, it will result in a completely different hash. So this is by design. So MD5 hash is a cryptographic hash and uh, any uh, modification of the original file, they on purpose result in a completely different output. Um, mm. So, and this is like, if we just use MD5 hashes, we will find only byte by byte exact duplicates. But of course, people like fraudsters uh, will find a way around this, just adding a pixel and then, uh, or compressing, like taking uh, an image and compressing it from 90% JPEG to 80% JPEG, and then it's a new file, different MD5 hash. Okay, um, or just slightly crop it. That would yes, be... exactly. Um, for catching these cases, uh, there are different kinds of hashes. They are called perceptive hashes. So these hashes, if you change the input slightly, they do not change at all, or they change only slightly. So they are kind of locality sensitive hashes. Um, mm -hmm. If you resize an image, the hash stays the same. If you modify a few pixels, or even add a watermark, or remove a watermark from an image. Watermark is like, for example, in the corner of an image, you can say it's Olix. If you remove this, uh, it will be a different image, but hash will likely still be the same. Um, mm -hmm. Resize, chain compression, uh, all this will result in the same uh, perceptive hash. So there are a bunch of them, like uh, dhash, bhash, hash. Um, so they they all perceptive, they Im are implemented differently, but there's a library image hash that we use for actually calculating this, it's a Python library. Um, so, and we took this library and uh, calculated hashes for uh, all the images. We again uh, used the same approach with, uh, um, with S3 events. And so we just subscribe to S3 events and uh, for every image that is uploaded, we calculate these hashes. Uh, then there is a Lambda function, AWS Lambda that uh, does that, uh, calculating hashes, then uh, once it's done, uh, the hash is put to another queue, uh, hashes queue, and then uh, from this, there is a ingester consumer that pulls from this queue and puts this to Elasticsearch. So Lambda can scale 
infinitely, so it just scales very nice. Uh, but we don't want to scale this ingester uh, too much because it will kill uh, our database. So that's why um, we made this separation. So computing hashes separately from actually putting them to uh, the storage, uh, to Elasticsearch. Mm -hmm. um, so this way we can, like this is expensive iteration, fetch an image, calculating a hash, uh, and then putting them to S3 is less expensive, but we at the same time do not want to overload our database. Hmm. And so then this is, yeah, sorry. Uh, this, so uh, there's a question I'm just putting mm -hmm. in here. Um, so this, is getting generated when the when the when the image is uploaded, or is yes, this exactly. is that when the when the thing goes live, or no? So the moment uh, image is in the S3 bucket, so the moment user uploads an image from their phone or from the website, the image is in S3 bucket, and at that time, the moment it's in S3 bucket, we get an event from S3. Hey, an object is created. Here you go. Please do something with this, and then. Uh, this Lambda looks at the name of the file, goes to S3, gets the file from there, and the computer hashes. Mm -hmm. So this happens right after the image is uploaded. Mm. So, so you could, could, could you then basically um, hold a listing because it, it might be fraudulent? Or no, is... Yes, we do this, but um, uh, uh, so the listing is hold. Right? It's reviewed by moderators. And we again want to concentrate the attention of moderators of, on the most important things. So if there is a duplicate, then we show it moderators. If there is not mm -hmm. a duplicate, then we don't. So yeah, in this case, the system that design decides whether the item should go live or not is a different system. But it can ask this system, this image index, for input. Oh, like, okay. okay, is this ad good? Should we allow it? to go live or should we ask moderators to look at this uh, if, uh, we say that there is a duplicate potentially somewhere then uh, moderators need to look huh that's cool okay mm -hmm. uh, the, the again about the these queues where the hashes are um mm -hmm. because there there is uh, the question is this kinesis or is this something different yes yes Okay, um, that's just that's usual uh, simple queue service from this. Uh, okay, it's a lot easier to use. So with uh, Kinesis, um, like there is some uh, uh, overhead, like you need to store the pointers in the stream. With SPS, it's easy. You just take something from the queue, and then you acknowledge the message is gone. So it's, mm, uh, it's, it's just FIFO for first in, first out. Uh, not necessarily. They do not guarantee the order. There is an option to do okay. FIFO, uh, but uh, also like the, the other option is no particular guarantee. It's FIFO-like, um, so uh, items items you put earlier, messages you put earlier tend to arrive earlier, uh, but not always. Hmm. Um, this is super simple to use. It's HTTPS. Uh, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Good thing because it's simple to use. Bad thing is uh, at some point, uh, if uh, it has to be really fast, it will be slow. But for 10 million uh, images per day, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, interesting. Okay. And th there are two types of events that we can uh, get from S3. So first type of event is then something is put to S3 and the second type of event when something is removed to S3. We also want to know when something is removed to, to keep this in uh, the index. Uh, and this way we can ask it, okay, well, does this, like, was this image used in something that was removed uh, recently? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people like frosters, they wait till uh, that is gone and then they use the image. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, for that, uh, and we can also, uh, at this point, we store pretty much everything, but we also, in the future, want to start uh, kicking out all data based on uh, uh, condition date. So there, there is no point in uh, uh, storing data for a year, for example. Mm. 
uh, for mm. a few months, yes, um, but not for a year. How how is that with uh, with this whole um, privacy stuff? Because you're you're basically you're keeping something in store, although it it um, it is deleted. So we can the... keep it for fourteen months, I think. The GDPR. Okay. GDPR uh, requires like to for these things to be deleted after fourteen months. This th thing is live only for a few months. So mm -hmm. we keep this in mind, but uh, there is no uh, procedure now for removing old uh, items. But this is pretty easy to use now. When yeah, the time yeah. comes. Yeah, I, I mean, this is usually this stuff is uh, is not um, doesn't fall under the under the uh, man. How is that called in English? The the uh, DSGVO the the. The new, Europe, the new European data protection stuff yeah. because it's it's not really personal data it's it's images mm -hmm. of a car or something so yeah but just to, to be on the safe side uh, we still try to to, to follow GPR requirements and delete yeah. things uh, yeah, GDPR, older than yeah. fourteen months yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense but it, it's it's an interesting thing that they are that that they basically could. Other way they could wait for the ad uh, until the ad is removed and then recycle the image and mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. Um, let me just uh, have a quick look at the chat if there's an interesting question. Um, oh, it's, uh, I'd say okay. Th there's the now. Uh, let's let's move on this. Guys are chatting amongst themselves. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So this slide, I just wanted to to show how lambdas are super easy to scale. Um, uh -huh. So it requires no um, like nothing. Just it is more traffic scaled up. Um, so the peak that we have uh, is uh, hundred something requests per second. Maybe not okay. quite. Not. Super many, but still quite some load, uh, and basically requires nothing from me. Of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier in uh, SageMaker versus uh, self-hosted uh, SREs, like DevOps engineers, do not really like this when something is out of, the con of their control. Um, so eventually, we might move away from lambdas to self-hosted. Um, but for things like this, when you want to uh, to deal with spikes in traffic easily, lambdas are perfect. And mm. for things that can parallelize, be parallelized, like uh, like this hash, hash calculation, lambdas make uh, a lot of sense in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, that's so the, the down, downside is uh, same as with SageMaker: hard to monitor, harder to monitor, uh, harder to have alerts, harder to have logging. Uh, but for this one, uh, since it's not as expensive uh, um, so money wise it's similar self-hosted or not um, so that's why it's now for lambdas on, on aws lambda mm. um, uh, just well, just a quick uh, a quick response here uh, hamza was asking um with the hash we we have talked about the hash um that is only the hash is is only uh, or it's a different hash than md5 so if you zoom in the picture then it only changes the hash a bit and well you can with zooming zoom. in it's uh, more complex so it's okay. likely to result in uh, entirely in a, a different hash for perceptive hashes as well so if you take an image and you crop it from the middle uh perceptive hashes are not likely to be spotted to find it okay but for simple uh, manipulations uh, they're fine oh, okay Hmm. So there are some limitations. So next steps for us is to to have a model, a neural net that generates hmm. hashes, and these hashes should uh, should be resilient to this kind of modification. So some, when somebody yeah. takes a crop or somebody rotates an image, uh, then we should be able to to still uh, to still find the original. So this is uh, in plans. 
And uh, once this uh, system uh, image index is adopted everywhere, um, and well, it's relatively fresh. But scammers, like people, uh, like people who use the platform, especially scammers, they will quickly learn how to bypass this, and uh, uh, they will do different kind of things to to fool the system. So we will eventually, in a couple of quarters, maybe have to uh, to do, to to have a solution for that. Uh, mm -hmm. But for now, this is already very helpful to find uh, a lot of uh, duplicates. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I think I'm being kicked from the the, the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I I've I've already seen that you have you were on your last slide, right? Yes, actually, uh, that's uh, contact information from me. Uh, these slides will be made available uh, mm. after the session. And also, I wanted to mention that we um, at Felix are looking for people, engineers, in many locations, mostly uh, in India. So please uh, check the link. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the, now that's unfortunate that you, you're being. Yes, I'm here. sorry. I uh, <laughs> to... Okay. Um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Like say for yes. for this for this meeting that was yes, really so really it. interesting. Um, no, it's uh, we we should have talked about an end. Uh, where where is the where is the hard end of this meeting? So that was also my fault that not not asking about when we when we have to finish. Mm -hmm. um, let's do it this way, guys. Uh, the questions that you have. Um, we we make a post on LinkedIn and you ask the questions there as well, or I copy some yes. of them and then we both can can mm -hmm. uh, yes, maybe answer and, and talk about this. Yeah, and I, I'm going to uh, he's going to give me the links he's shown and uh, the link to the slide share and then we can we can share this stuff. Yes. So thank you okay. for like having it. me. I it was great. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, very very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And and say the say the guys uh, sorry that that we've. Yes, I am very sorry for that. <laughs> that yes. that <laughs> okay. Bye bye, bye Alexei. End the meeting. Okay, guys. Uh, that was the first. That was the first stream. Uh, with a with a live guest, I I had a. Uh, I just remembered that I had Kate uh, strategy here on as well, but um, that was the the first guest uh, for the um, case studies or for the use cases. Uh, would be interesting to to know if you like this. Uh, if I should do something better, if if the image was okay, or if should I zoom him more out? Um, I would have said, um, or I, I would have hoped to have more of a Q and A at the end, but. Yeah, it's, I'm sorry. It was totally my fault that I I haven't asked him uh, when the when we should have finished or if we have a hard end of of the meeting. That was. Uh, um. I'm. I'm. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to go into the chat and I'm going to copy. Um. Copy in Alexei's LinkedIn. Just uh, how am I going to do this here? YouTube. Um, okay. Um, here's the. Here's. No, it doesn't let me. Sh oh, God damn it. Um, uh, you can. Uh, you can. Uh, you can go to my LinkedIn. I'm going to post a a link, and so on. Um, okay. What if we? S okay, there was. A Hamza says thanks a lot. Alex was really insightful. Yeah, yeah, I I find this stuff 
this stuff interesting. Nick says, Andreas, be honest, you like data science stuff, right? Um, if you if you mean the the machine learning part and so on, I find it find it super interesting um, to find out basically how, what problems are you, are people tackling, what what systems, what infrastructure are they using um, to do that, and because. Because the data engineering part is, I, I'm, like I always say, it's the plumbing. It's to make uh, the whole data science uh, possible. It's 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 to make possible that they that they can find duplicates and so on, and and that they are they can find fraudulent um, listings, and so for for me it's 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 yeah it's very interesting to to see it applied and to see how they apply it and yeah i <laughs> i love this stuff and uh yeah alexei i uh, i was really unfortunate that he had to leave this quick um yeah i i, I love this stuff and I, I find it interesting and this is this is always the problem with automation um you you can do so you can do so much and you can do so much machine learning but uh there's always the the this this point or or this this uh this threshold before this threshold of confidence you have to do some moderating you have to um uh, you have to you have somebody to look over it because if you would set it live and 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 have it completely on its own and make the decision on its own the algorithm make the decision on its own then you would run into a lot of problems but as you here is the same thing OLX at some point the the moderation rate is going down how much uh, manual work you have to do and at some point they they are going to be so confident in these cases that everything can be automated um at uh, dragonfly it's not a holiday here uh i'm i'm on parental leave right now because uh you can have up to two months of of leave after a of after you have a child and I, this is our son is getting uh, is becoming one year this month so i'm having a month i've split it into four four week or a month after birth and then the last month when it gets a year so i'm <laughs> i'm like a holiday um um yeah yeah it's all about solving the problems uh, th the thing is and and i have talked about uh, with him uh before we started we had a, had a discussion where we are heading um i i want to leave this stuff or i want to mention this stuff here what are people doing and how are they doing it and because only fixating on the on the on the the systems and what systems uh, are used that's not that's not really that doesn't really make sense uh, i don't want to uh, get this channel into a data scientist channel where we go into algorithms and this algorithm does that and if you do the configuration for this then this is the outcome i want to i want to um th this was a great start here because it it gives you a picture of what are people what problems do people have how are they trying to solve it and what systems are they are they using and the, the the i think there was a question from nick before that i i think um yeah there was the question what framework do you mostly uh, use tensorflow and what language do you use for it mostly um java i think this we should ask this question on linkedin um and and try to, to try to, i would have asked him this question but uh, unfortunately we didn't get to it okay guys um great stream i i want to do this more often uh 
if you have a if you know some someone who has some interesting uh, problems that they're solving and this can be and and some some genius engineering behind it um let me know send them to me uh, get in touch plumbers of data science at gmail.com or my linkedin um, send me a dm on linkedin and i hope to do this more often to to invite people and yeah now it's uh it's almost 12 12 o'clock here i'm going to have uh something to eat and then uh, i'm not sure if i do a stream tonight i don't i i think i, I we're going to see each other tomorrow um look for the for the linkedin i'm going to uh i'm going to do some posts about this and let's try to get alexei uh, into the conversation and ask him some stuff yeah and check out his profile and the the slide share uh okay um i'm out uh see you tomorrow bye bye great having you guys <laughs>